Hi, everyone, and welcome to this German Marshall Fund uh, event on promoting diversity and inclusion in governments across the Atlantic. My name is Louise Langeby, and I'm the deputy director of our Brussels office. And I'm really delighted to have two excellent speakers with us to discuss this important topic today. Uh, from the US, we have Ambassador uh, Abercrombie Winstanley, who serves as the chief diversity and inclusion officer at the State Department. And from the European side, we have Ms. Michaela Moua, who serves as the EU's first anti-racism coordinator in the European Commission. So delighted to have both of you with us here today. And I also want to say a big thank you to the US mission to the EU for our, their support and for helping us make this event happen today. Uh, without further ado, I will hand it over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Corinna Hurst, who will be moderating the discussion today. Corinna is uh, the director of GMF's uh, program on uh, leadership, and she also leads a lot of GMF's work on diversity and inclusion. Um, and just for you, the audience today, so you know, um, you can submit your questions during the event using the Q&A function, and we'll try to incorporate them as well as we can. And then we also have the option for closed captioning. So if you have a look at the bottom of your screen and you click live transcript, that's available to you as well. Over to you, Corinna, and thank you. Thank you, Louise, and a warm welcome and thank you to our panelists for joining us uh, this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you sit. Very delighted to be able to have this conversation with you. And again, a reminder to the audience, happy to take questions. Please uh, submit them in the Q&A um, button so we can weave them into the conversation or you know, have, have them answered at the end. So let's get started. Um, Ambassador, I would love to start with you. Um, you are, yeah, the, sort of, you have a big task um, really about uh, adjusting, changing, adapting the US State Department. And I remember um, Ambassador, um, <laughs> whoops, now I'm, this is a, a big blurb. Um, Blinken said, announcement about your position that he wants you he wants the State Department to represent uh, America and he wants the State Department to be more accessible and to be better equipped to do foreign policy so what does that how how did you approach your work and you know how do you would like to see the full spectrum of diversity um, be reflected um, so and shown so please Sure. Well, first of all, thank you so much for the German Marshall Fund for sponsoring this discussion. I'm looking forward to a robust engagement because indeed it, this kind of change takes all of us. Um, I am fond of saying, and I said before I got the job, that it needs to be approached with transparency, indigeneity, and accountability. Uh, we in the United States, I won't speak for the rest of the world, have been talking about the importance of diversity and inclusion, about the value of it. Um, certainly in my professional career, we have spoken a lot about women, but we're talking about gender parity as opposed to diversity. And the importance of having this range of voices at the table to ensure that we are getting the full range of options of recommendations as we approach the challenges that we're facing in the 21st century. So plenty out there for us to do. Transparency, talking about what exactly we intend to do and why we intend to do it and making sure that our entire workforce understands that this commitment is not the secretary's, it's not mine, it's not my office's, it's everyone's. So that is the intentionality, the transparency, as I said, of making sure people understand what we're going to do, how we're going to approach it and accountability. And that is a dual-sided important coin, that accountability for doing what we expect of each other as leaders, as colleagues, to make inclusive, safe, non-toxic workplaces, and that accountability, which is to ensure that people are rewarded for doing the work. So held accountable for not doing it and rewarded for doing it. And that two sides, I think, will help us move forward. 
Thank you so much. I definitely would like to come back on the accountability, but let's mm -hmm. uh, move on the other side of, of the Atlantic. And Ms. Moore, if I could ask you um, to come in. You, the European Union has sort of approached us a little bit um, different. You are in charge of the anti-racism sort of portfolio. Your work is also much more um, outward looking in the sense that, uh, you know, clearly defines you to engage with member states of the EU, the European External Action Service, the European Parliament, civil society. So what are your priorities and how are you interacting with colleagues within the European Commission who focus on other aspects of the diversity, whether it is um, anti-Semitism, whether it's the Roma community, which is Europe's largest ethnic um, community, or disability or the GLBTQ plus um, community? Thank you, Corinna. Uh, thank you for having me also to the German Marshall Fund and, and uh, also for uh, facilitating this space uh, for me to, to, to meet with you and especially to meet with uh, Ambassador Abercrombie Winston Lee. It's really uh, a pleasure uh, and an honor to, to be in the same space with you. So, so thank you for, for facilitating this to the, to the German Marshall Fund. Um, indeed, so um, my, my role as the, as the EU anti-racism coordinator in a nutshell, is to ensure that we, um, me and my team and the commission successfully implement the EU anti-racism action plan, which is quite a, quite a broad, uh, horizontal um, and quite a, um, ambitious action plan. It's the first uh, EU anti-racism action plan, and I am indeed the first uh, 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 such coordinator. So it's a lot of um, there's a lot of expectations. There's a lot of uh, um, um, uh, you know from the civil society side, especially. There's a lot of expectations. They have been advocating for such a, a action plan for for uh, years now, and now that it's here, and it, it is quite ambitious. It, we really hope to uh, do a, a good job during my mandate, um, and this needs to be done together. This is uh, something that has to be done in cooperation with close cooperation with civil society, first of all. Uh, second of all, with other um, member states, of course, play a, an extremely important role um, on the member state level uh, in uh, ensuring uh, that the combat, the fight against racism moves forward. And here we're working with ensuring that member states have their respective national action plans against racism uh, by the end of this year. And then, of course, there is the uh, close cooperation with other uh, European institutions, such as the, the European Parliament, uh, the Council of Europe, um, etc. So, um, and, and of course, I also uh, will be working closely with academia because I think it's very important to have, um, you know, uh, to ensure that um, we are making evidence-based policy, building the policy on uh, data um, related to uh, racism and discrimination. Um, then to answer your question, we indeed have before me already, so in 2015, the commission appointed a, um, a EU um, anti-Semitism coordinator, as well as an EU uh, anti-Muslim hatred coordinator. And then in addition, there is a Roma team in the commission, as well as there is work done on, of course, gender equality, uh, work on uh, dis disability equality, as well as LGBTIQ. So uh, my work, uh, it is explicitly stated in the EU anti-racism action plan that the work needs to be done uh, intersectionally. Um, and for me, as a, as, an old, as, a, as, a, as a former basketball player, meaning a team player, um, I take this as uh, such an opportunity to work with colleagues who are extreme experts in their uh, respective um, policy areas uh, and who can only make me um, ensure that I am able to do my work better. Um, so really, this is about us, us doing uh, this work together with an intersectional framework. Um, so there, I, I will. Um, uh, I will maybe talk a little bit more about the diversity and inclusion aspect of the commission a little bit later on, because it is kind of one of the pieces of the puzzle of the um, EU anti-racism action plan. But very close to what uh, Ambassador was saying, uh, linking to the commission really now looking also inward, um, uh, recognizing that as a 
as such a, a major, major public institution, we need to uh, be sure that also the Commission staff reflects the diversity in the EU, uh, in the EU society. Uh, and here we, we are doing a lot of work, which I can talk, uh, talk about um, uh, further along. Thank you so much. And you give me the wonderful segue because I would like both of you, you, you sketch sort of the big picture. Um, I think it is very clear there is an institutional approach as well as sort of the individual approach or requirement. We all have something to do. Could you talk a little bit, uh, yeah, bring forward two, three sort of specific examples that you're currently working on that sort of exemplifies a little bit sort of the mission you've set yourself as, um, you know, the first EU anti-racism coordinator or the first chief officer on, on, on sort of diversity and inclusion. And then within that also, so how do you create those incentives and rewards for teams and units and individuals to come along and what is it possible, um, what is possible in a sense of, of, of holding institutions uh, accountable, how far they sort of, uh, of go. Ambassador if, uh, Ambassador, if I could ask you to maybe um, address that first. Oh, sure. So starting on a couple of specific things that uh, we have already put in place and are putting in place. I've been in this position uh, 10 months now, April will be a full year. And I tell you, I came to it impatient. Again, we've been talking about this for a long time. Um, I would not have taken the job if I had not felt I had the full support, uh, a, a lot of pushing from behind from the secretary, from leadership in the department, my colleagues, as well as a strong push from below, from those who are new diplomats who are working their way up. And even if it's not a hundred percent, because nothing ever is, there is a recognition that everybody deserves to reach their full potential, that the, the playing field needs to be level, that our current statistics show clearly, because um, as earlier mentioned, data is so important. And I've got a data working group now, a data scientist that we've added to the team, and we are sharing the data within our organization. So nobody can hide from the numbers. And the numbers make very clear that the current methods of promotion, getting to the top of our organization, it's not based on merit. And that's what we say we stand for. But the stark reality is that women, people with disabilities, uh, people with different sexual orientations, uh, ethnic minorities, brown people, we don't become more stupid as we move up the ladder. So the fact that we have 87% from one group and that's not the makeup of the population, makes very clear something else is going on. And just as no one brown, no one female wants to say, I got here because I have brown skin or I have a womb, um, nobody male wants to say that either. And so as I am building coalitions and understanding among all of our employees, all of our colleagues, we're making that very clear. Inclusion means everyone, everyone. So we mean business. A difference from what we've done in the past is for our diplomats, our foreign service officers, we have now changed, we negotiated with our union and we have changed the standards against which people are judged for promotion. And even if everybody doesn't agree 100% that they wanna share the pie, everybody wants to get promoted. We are highly ambitious, and if not ambitious, competitive group of people in our US diplomatic corps. So among the things that we're judging, including leadership and communication skills, we are judging how well have you concretely supported diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility? What have you done to make this organization more inclusive? Who have you supported? What lines have you reached across to find and help someone who doesn't look like you? What are you doing to expand our range of contacts, programming? Because it's outward as well as inward as well. You know, it's easy to 
fall into a, a set, a, a you know, a set group of contacts for an embassy, and, and you stay there and it's comfortable, but we're supposed to be reaching everywhere. So everyone within a host nation. So what are you doing to help dance? We have a number of things that we are messaging to our colleagues to help them understand what's expected of them, how they're going to be judged, and making sure they understand it, that if they don't meet these this criterion about DEIA, as well as the other things that we judge on, they will not be promoted. So I think that's going to help people understand that we mean business this time. The other thing that we're working on is increasing our transparency. I'll be a little bit diplomatic now and say that our processes for promotion, for assignments have been opaque in the past, that it has been very important to be well-connected, to have worked for someone or with someone who knows you and your work personally, and therefore can support you, what we call sponsor you for a promotion, for an assignment, um, for a specific position, which means you have to be in the know, you have to be connected. So there are a number of things that we have for assignments for senior positions in particular, and the people in the know know who the deciders are. I love that word, the deciders from George W. Bush. Um, but the rest of us didn't know. We were like, oh, I don't, how do you get an assignment at the White House? How do you get to be a deputy assistant secretary? Who, who controls that? And, and it wasn't known, it wasn't known. So for the first time since I've come into the position, we have publicized who the deciders are, who's on the committee that assigns our principal officers, our deputy chief of mission, who's on the committee that picks ambassadors, deputy assistant secretaries. So just making sure that we're leveling the playing field so that everybody knows, so we can all make our best case, whatever that is. We have looked at our hiring practices. Is everyone interviewed the same way? Ask the same questions, either by phone, by video, in person but leveling that playing field and we are publicizing the data. So everybody knows who's in their bureau, who's in their office, at what rank. And you can see that depending on what group you belong to, you know, women get stopped here and then thin out. Uh, Hispanics get stopped here and then thin out. African-Americans get stopped here, Asian-Americans get stopped here, et cetera, so that we can see and do barrier analysis to find out what's blocking women, what's blocking African-Americans, what's blocking Hispanics, what changes do we need to make, either to make things more transparent or to remove barriers or to provide support so that we can get the best and the most out of our most important resource. I mean, it's very common sense and straightforward for me. And I do a lot of messaging on it to help others open their eyes and come. So those are things that we're doing. A lot more is on the table. I haven't been there a year yet. I would say there's already a lot um, that you have accomplished. So congratulations. Um, Michaela, we said, May, can I turn to you because you're dealing in somewhat with a different kind of institution. So there's certain things you can influence and others sort of less so. Um, but talk a little bit again, you know, kind of bring forward a, f a couple of examples because I think, you know, they really tell stories and uh, give an opportunity for people to recognize that uh, the European Union is, is taking this seriously. Indeed, um, thank you so much. I mean, it's so interesting, really, Ambassador, to hear you. And 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 I must say, you are uh, uh, on the next level to to where we are uh, currently. You know, uh, we are really just getting started with our work. Um, but I think that's always the first step. You know, we can't work on something that we uh, are in denial about. You know, so I what I'm really proud of is that we also have now, for the first time. A, had a, um, a survey on the diversity of the staff of the commission, uh, which we um, had a fairly good um, um, respondents rate uh, to where we were able to see exactly the data uh, uh, as far as diversity, now, not, not only when it comes to, to um, you know, uh, racialized staff, but also, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the other um, protected characteristics in the treaties uh, of the EU, meaning disability, gender, um, um, 
so disability, gender, race, race, race or ethnic origin, and all of the, the other um, protected characteristics. This was, of course, uh, voluntary and um, based on self-identification, but it was the first time where staff was given the opportunity, at least, to give this information. And also, we looked at, um, you know, how the inclusion, not just the diversity part, but the inclusion part. And now the, all the work we are being, we're doing after that is being built on the results of this data. So uh, in addition to that, um, uh, we are putting in structures. I think creating structures to, um, for sustainable DNI, diversity, equity, uh, and inclusion and accountability work, which I really liked how you added that in there, mm -hmm. uh, very important. I think you need and to look at structures, or if they're not there, you need to create, uh, if they're not, if they are there, look at, are they um, working the way they're supposed to work? And then if they're not there, they need to be created. So for instance, a diversity and inclusion, the first diversity and inclusion office was also created uh, in 20, and has been operational since May of last year. Um, and it is indeed this one-stop shop for the internal diversity and inclusion uh, work in the commission. We are looking at the other structures um, that bring people into the commission, i.e. the recruitment processes, the traineeships. Um, uh, we are really looking at these closely now and seeing where they need to be amended uh, to where we can ensure that at least the, the pool of applicants is more diverse and then go from there. But I think we are really on only in the beginning stages of, of the work. Um, but, um, you know, you have to start somewhere. Um, what I really liked about what Ambassador said earlier is about kind of like who is in the room or who is in at the table. And uh, I think this sometimes is kind of the part of the conversation that we don't um, emphasize is, is it's not just doing this work for the sake of having diversity in institutions uh, such as the commission. But for instance, uh, with the commission, we are um, uh, an institution uh, that has three main functions. So it's, it's, it's uh, uh, legislation, drafting legislation, drafting policy and funding. So these are kind of the main three, um, you know, roles of the commission. Um, and if you don't have people at those tables drafting legislation, people at those tables drafting policy who have different um, viewpoints, different lived experiences, um, it's, what will happen is that we will make policy and legislation uh, uh, that is not taking all vulnerable groups into, uh, into account and then you know, um, people will be, groups will be left behind. So I think this is the, the really important part of the conversation is why it's really important to have um, uh, all, all diversity, uh, all kinds of diversity at those decision-making tables. Um, it, it really, this is kind of, it's the end goal, right? To ensure that the policy and legislation that is being drafted and made will really be such that it actually creates change on the ground for everybody. Thank you. No, this is great. I wanted to ask you one follow-up question. Um, Ambassador Abercrombie Winstanley mentioned, you know, they're collecting data and in the US side in the State Department to really look at the numbers. Um, and you also mentioned, you know, the, the survey of the EU staff and, you know, it was sort of very much self-identified um, how they are wanting to portray themselves. I mean, this really points to a, 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 an issue that exists on the European side, that it's incredibly difficult to actually get one's hand on ethnic mm -hmm. data because our 27 member states are dealing with the subject matter very, very differently. Um, you know, we have some countries that basically don't allow to gather that kind of information. So could you say a little bit more about how you <laughs> yeah worked around that or how do you still try to get as close as possible to working on the subject matter without maybe having the same data available as ambassador abercrombie winstanley in the us yes very very good very important work um very closely related to of course the work i'm doing as mentioned you know 
uh, data is crucial uh, in ensuring that then the policy that is built on top of it is, is uh, efficient. Um, and this is something that the, the, the Commission has been advocating for, uh, pushing for, for quite some time now, is um, moving towards harmonizing the collection of equality data um, um, across the EU to ensure that it would be indeed comparable between the member states, uh, reliable and comparable uh, between the member states, for instance, over time. So we could, we could really uh, have the full scope of the situation um, in the EU um, as regards to different groups uh, um, and, and in the different uh, member states. Um, so what, um, for instance, in relation to the EU action plan, um, the anti-racism action plan, um, we recently uh, came out uh, with a uh, guidelines uh, to actually help member states um, um, move forward on um, how exactly equality data, such equality data can be actually collected. Um, of course, here we always have to take into account that a prerequisite for for progress towards such a common data set is really having full respect for, for instance, constitutional norms, EU data protection legislation, and also, of course, the EU Charter for Fundamental Rights. And such safeguards need to be in place um, because this such a, like um, sensitive equality data can, uh, cannot be uh, related back to the individual. Um, and, and it actually can be done in compliance uh, with data protection rules. Um, and these guidelines that we, we recently um, in September published uh, kind of give us these step-by-step -step, um, um, the way that it can be done. And it, indeed, in some, some member states, it is um, illegal to collect um, data uh, based on ethnicity. But uh, even there, for instance, in surveys, it, it is possible to do it if it is based on self-identification. Uh, there are certain kind of principles that need to be in place, such as self-identification, full transparency on uh, uh, as to why such um, data is being collected and for what it will be used and uh, the, ensuring the privacy in it indeed and having these certain um, 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 uh, safeguards in place. I'd just like to mention as an example, uh, back in my native Finland, uh, I, I worked for the EU, uh, for the um, equality body, for the Finnish equality body, the non-discrimination non, uh, ombudsperson's office. And we did indeed a, a survey uh, um, on uh, people of African descent and the discrimination that they were facing uh, in employment and in education. And um, it was indeed based on these principles, and it was such an important um, um, uh, experience because not only for myself, but also for actually those people who answered, I mean, the most common feedback we received that uh, for once uh, we actually felt seen because mm -hmm. we were able to identify based on how we actually identify and not uh, by proxy which is given by somewhere outside, for instance, using uh, terms like, um, I don't know, uh, of migration background for someone who actually identifies as black. So I right. think this is also very, very important to recognize, but we are working hard on, on moving forward um, uh, on um, indeed harmonizing um, equality data collection across the EU. And, uh, and it can be done, but it okay. also, almost a pedagogical exercise. I, we need to talk after this, my dear, because <laughs> I need to know how to do that. Yes. You know, our organization, most of our organization is in fact overseas, our, our locally engaged staff, our whole station staff. And my work, even with the internal focus includes all of us. And of course, navigating local rules about you can't collect, you can't collect, you can't, et cetera. I'd love a further conversation because I need it on everybody. So would love to. Great. Um, Ambassador Abercrombie, Win Stanley, this is a perfect segue. So there is a question actually from Monaco, um, one of the participants, and I'd like to uh, bring this question in. Uh, 
So Wolfgang Jukusch is asking, how do you roll out your DNI strategy to the US representations worldwide, especially in countries and cultures that may not be open to some categories of diversity? So for example, LGBTQ plus policies in Saudi Arabia or um, Malaysia. And then his follow-up question is, should there be one global approach to DEI or do we need to adjust to local preferences? Or how do we balance, you know, my follow-up yeah. question, how do we balance sort of the values that we have with a, on the, sort of in the United States or Europe versus recognizing and respecting um, the values and traditions in some other countries? Yeah, you know, it's it's uh, an age old question and one that will challenge us, I, I dare say, for some time to come. I mean, you're, you're asking a question of the first woman who led a diplomatic mission in Saudi Arabia. I was the first one and the only one for uh, most of the time in the country. Um, I will admit I made mistakes while I was there. When I look back on it now, I, I think about a couple of things that I would have done differently that I might not have pressed so firmly to be in a particular space or to do a particular action. But the bottom line is approaching it with respect. Respect goes forward and all around everything that we as representatives do in any country, it, it must. And recognizing that I am a representative or we are representatives of our own country. So respectfully, I might modify my wardrobe while I was in Saudi Arabia. I certainly did, um, but I did not wear an abaya, for instance. I was modest, but not co covered. And so you, you've got to balance those sorts of things. You're not always going to get it right. That just absorb that, accept that, and keep it moving, as my mom used to say. On LGBTQAI issues in particular, it's something that we are very focused on in our organization because my organization is wants to be represented by everyone that's in the country and that means everybody and, and navigating the space to ensure that they receive the respect and welcome that accrues to a US diplomat. So that's the balance that we are continually engaged in, recognizing that there are local mores. And, you know, the reality is, I, I said it to someone, probably haven't said it publicly, but the reality is every place is not for everyone, for whatever reason. And we all make calculations and, and recognize our constraints. You know, some people don't want to be apart from their Families, for instance, you can't take small children to some places because of the education, for instance. I mean, there are any number of things that go into our calculations about where we are going to serve and be able to serve successfully, bringing our whole person to the job. And so, again, this is something that we balance and push forward on as best we can through the lens of respect for ourselves, our culture, and for our host nation. It might not be an entirely satisfying answer, but it's it's a messiness of reality. Nothing's perfect. We've got to navigate it. Thank you. Um, I have another question that I would love to bring in, um, and both of you are welcome to comment on this. And um, it is the opportunity to see anti-racism leadership lessons learned at the subnational levels, um, as for example, with mayors or, or others, you know, and particularly at certain local politicians on both of the um, Atlantic who've had experiences of being victims of um, anti-discrimination, how you are taking these examples and maybe bring them into your jobs to shape uh, legislation policies or incentives for structural change or behavioral change. Michaela, maybe you want to go first. Uh, I'm not sure I, I understand the question. I'm sorry. No, uh, whether you can comment on the opportunity to see anti-racism leadership lessons learned at the subnational levels, if that is sort of influencing the work that you do now on the European level, that the ah. examples that you're collecting. Sorry. Yes, yes. Um, I mean, 
my personal uh, uh, journey uh, has, has been, I, I think I've been very fortunate because I really started on the grassroots, uh, uh, ended up working first on the, on the local level uh, and then ended up on the member state level uh, in, in Finland uh, in the Ministry of Justice. And I think I have brought all of these, uh, uh, all, of the, all parts of my journey with me to, to the commission now. Um, plus, I have this whole different kind of career before I became a civil servant, being a professional athlete. So mm -hmm. all of this is with me now, really. But um, as far as uh, uh, the lessons learned uh, and what I have been able to, to bring with me is, I think, because I have had the opportunity to work on so many different levels, I can also uh, make policy uh, I can affect that. I can ensure, try to ensure at least that policy is built with that, uh, re with recognizing uh, all these different levels, recognizing the the, the, the grassroots level, the the the, the local uh, levels, uh, cities, um, uh, municipalities, um, and also the member state levels. And now, of course, bringing all of that to 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 um, the the policy making uh, on the EU level. Um, yeah, so I, I hope I was able to, to answer, answer the question. If I may add to that, that um, I understood very well. Uh, if I may add, just, you know, thinking about sub-national level, and of course I've been in federal service for many years, nonetheless, um, there certainly are some commonalities for leaders um, that are going to be useful. And, and so my, my bandwagon, uh, this week, and I, I sort of go through accountability, transparency, intentionality, and different aspects. So this one on the accountability side, uh, it's it's come up in meetings with leaders in the last several weeks, where a leader is doing a great thing by holding what we call a town hall or a broad discussion with colleagues, with employees about issues that are out there, whether it's racism, whether it's George Floyd's murder, whether it's, um, you know, any aspect of this. And it could be any aspect. It doesn't have to be racism, quite frankly. It could be sexism. It could be homophobia. It could be, you know, discrimination against those with disabilities. I mean, frankly, it's all out there. And a discussion and then something happened in the meeting, during the discussion, um, that clearly is highly negative. Mm -hmm. Whether it's someone, I heard about a call, so people's faces weren't up there, but as they were talking about how they felt after George Floyd's murder and people were sharing their horror, their sorrow, their sense of betrayal, their dismay, despair, you know, big, big emotions as people tried to grapple with this event that no one could hide from and what to do about it, how to be an ally, how to you know, protect yourself as you go forward. And someone on the line said, well, what's this about? Why are we spending time on this? What a waste, who cares? Hmm? Everybody heard it. And the leaders who were moderating the discussion said nothing just allowed it to go forward. A couple of other incidents, not immediately like that, but similar insofar as you see something, you hear something, you are aware of something bad happening there and you don't do anything about it in the moment. And a lot of times that happens because people don't know what to do and, and, and or they're afraid that whatever, you know, is happening to the victim, victims at the time might be turned on them. So there's fear, reasonable fear, but the reality is that we must speak up in the moment. And as leaders, it is our responsibility to do that. And there's several ways, you know, the first one, you know, just simply saying, okay, we all heard that, Let's talk about that. Why are we here? There's ways of doing that. And so I am a huge proponent of bystander intervention training to give us the tools to speak up, to handle the issue in the moment. Because those people who had that, you know, 
a fault. You know, as someone said, the feelings, why are we even discussing this? Uh, went away in pain and hurt and probably angry, not only with the person who said it, but with all the people on the call who didn't say anything, who didn't stand up for them. And so we're talking about that allyship. Often some of my colleagues will ask, what can I do? What should I be doing? And how to be a good ally. And so that's why I'm doing my push for bystander intervention training. I've taken it twice myself. I've used it many times because we can all insult or microaggress against each other. I can do it to Hispanics who can do it against gay people, who can do it against Jews, who can do it against people with disabilities. None of us are clean of making mistakes or you know, deliberate or non-deliberate as the case may be, it doesn't matter. We all can do it. No, no ego about this. We just need to do better. So, okay, thank you. No, it's very much, very important to address the blind spots that we are all bringing with us. Um, depending on where we come from and sort of our experience. Uh, Michaela, I didn't, don't know with, whether you wanted to come in on that. Otherwise, I would love to pick on, on the ally, um, the allyship. Uh, yes, um, yes, just listening in, um, I mean, just so, so, so wonderful to, to hear what the ambassador is, is talking about. And I think uh, for the work, um, that uh, I am doing, um, I personally feel like it has to be based on ind indeed allyship. Uh, uh, myself being an ally to, to the work my, my colleagues are doing in, in different policy areas related to human rights and, uh, and vice versa. I think this is the, um, the way, really the best way to move forward uh, uh, with the work of, from on an intersectional uh, aspect. And, and to add also to what Ambassador said, um, it, it can indeed be, be, we've all been in those situations before where, where something happens and we kind of uh, fall into shock of the situation, like did that actually just happen? happen? But what, what happens is this is also something that you have to practice because um, the, the more you kind of practice uh, um, acting, you know, when something uh, uh, inappropriate, racist, homophobic, sexist, et cetera, happens, the more you get kind of um, familiar and comfortable with it, just as with anything else. And it, it doesn't always have to be some grand gesture. Uh, it, it can also just be, for instance, uh, asking the person, uh, especially if, it, if it's a situation of danger, indeed, just going uh, and, and being next to the person uh, who just uh, uh, encountered uh, uh, such a situation and ensuring that they're okay. Uh, there are ways of doing this um, uh, in a way also that, that you're not uh, pu putting yourself in danger, of course. Mm -hmm. But I do think allyship is very important to any uh, human rights work that, that is being done. And also uh, with diversity, uh, equity, inclusion and accountability work, in my opinion, because um, you know, it's not just, uh, for instance, if I think about the commission, it, it's not just for those people who belong to some marginalized uh, group, uh, but it's for everybody. Uh, um, I think the more inclusive and safe uh, a working uh, environment is, the, the better the experience is for everybody. When we're in, an, uh, in a space where everybody can be fully who they are, they can show up to work, as who they are fully. It's actually a much better experience for everybody. Um, so I think this is also the part we sometimes forget. It's not just for those people who might experience discrimination, but it actually is for everybody. Yeah. I, I loved how both of you brought in some personal um, experiences in your work and also how one can address this um, on an individual level. But I also wanted to ask you about the allyship or partnership that um, are possible uh, for you being now in the public sector and you know, to what degree are you looking what's happening on the private sector or civil society 
sector and and you know whether there are sort of lessons learned for that and it actually leads me to a, a question um that one of the uh, one of the uh, partic um from the audience is coming what are your best tips for pushing diversity and inclusion policies internally in organizations where the resistant where there is resistance and where the value of such policies is not being recognized so uh, two angles to approach this. I don't know who wants to go first. Uh, happy to go first and then I'll leave Michaela with the tough, the tough part there. <laughs> um, certainly on the intersectionality between civil society and private sector and government on moving forward on diversity and inclusion, there's, there's a lot. Um, even before I took the position, I was active in the field and um, had what I call a kitchen cabinet of uh, chief diversity officers at organizations that were large and multinational um, that might have similarities to the Department of State about what you're trying to do. And so talking about what accountability means and, and what uh, the law allows, for instance, a private sector actually can do a lot more than I can in government. Um, uh, if you are, you know, espousing racist views, for instance, or homophobic views, as we've seen uh, in a lot of high profile instances, you can be dismissed in the private sector. In the public sector, it's much harder, uh, where your protection of freedom of speech is really uh, hard to say to someone working for the government, your support for you know, this, that, or the other theory or anti this, that, or the other, that you should lose your job. It, it's, it's almost impossible. It's very, very difficult. So you know, sometimes I listen enviously at some of the things that uh, my private sector colleagues can do. I've also learned from the private sector, and I think from any set of organizations, and uh, Michaela, watch out for this, is that people, you know, fiddle with the numbers. The numbers are the numbers, but how you interpret them. Are you using, you know, hard numbers? Are you using percentages? Are you measuring who you've got or are you measuring the percentage of people who are, you know, going for promotion? And is it a percentage of the overall or just their section of your organization. And you can do a lot of fiddling that make things look really good. So you've got to be not just the data, but really scrubbing it hard for truth. Um, and you have to stay on top of that because people will fiddle the numbers. Um, and so I, I got that because I was talking to a, a DEIA chief diversity officer in the private sector who was giving their numbers. And then they said that they took the numbers from the labor force. Well, you've got the population of the nation, the labor force of the nation, and then you can look and see how many, you know, Hispanics are in law enforcement, for example, or women here, etc. And then this person told me, well, we take the labor force, but we decide that the labor force is just in this part of the country, or this city, or these cities, or this part of the city. And then the numbers can look even better. So that's why I said you've got, you know, watch how you're counting. Uh, watch how you're counting. Again, the data is so important, but you've got to ask, okay, what's the frame? What, 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 is, what did you include or what did you use as your base for this, that, or the other? So that knowledge I got from my colleagues in the private sector, you know, to be very, very attentive to the numbers. Thank you for this wonderful tip. I, I, I wrote it down. <laughs> I'll laminate this and uh, have it with me all, all, all the time. Um, perhaps to answer to the, to the question uh, from, from the audience relating to uh, when there's resistance to, to the work we are doing, uh, uh, the question was related to uh, diversity and inclusion uh, uh, policies, but um, I mean, I'm doing anti-racism work, which is also something that uh, you can counter uh, resistance to oftentimes. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I really think this is a almost like a pedagogical exercise also in many ways. 
because um, when you think about, for instance, um, how gender equity has, has, has uh, the women's rights movement and gender equity has, has moved forward um, um, to, to where in general, uh, there is a, a, a understanding, a common understanding um, uh, that, of course, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, there should be gender balance in boards. There should be uh, gender balance in uh, man managerial positions, etc. I mean, this is something that is kind of, in in many in in many cases, kind of recognized as 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 a. Of course, this is how how it should be, or or this is what we should move forward, move towards. Uh, but not necessarily so much with other uh, uh, other protected characteristics, such as um, diversity uh, in um, uh, when it comes to, for instance, racial or ethnic minorities, or LGBTIQ folks, or uh, a disability uh, people with disabilities, etc. Um, so how do we how do we ensure that when we're talking about how do we move forward uh, also the, the you know on these other um, um, issues to ensure that when we're talking about diversity and inclusion, we mean the full scope of diversity and inclusion. And I think uh, when I said it's a pedagogical exercise, I think a lot of it is uh, not looking at this as cake, um, as if, uh, you know, if, if some, if we include somebody, then you're going to have less cake than before. That's uh, the wrong way of, 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 of looking at, at it. And I think once we, in a sense, um, it, it's, it's really a pedagogical exercise of, of explaining why this work is important, why it's important to, to have um, places of employment that are uh, inclusive, uh, take into account uh, the full, the, you know, the full range of diversity. Why it is important to, to live, to have societies that um, where human rights are important and people are not experiencing racism and discrimination when they try to apply for for, for jobs in education, etc. It's it's not only for those people who are experiencing uh, these things, but it's actually. Uh, uh, will be better for everybody to live in just societies and in truly inclusive uh, places of employment, etc. So I think, um, you know, I I I I feel like it, it's in a in in a sense this great uh, pedagogical experiment. Also, uh, 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 the work I am doing with with the with the anti-racism action plan, and I think this is. Um, like anything else, uh, you really do need to get those people uh, on the side of the thing you're trying to achieve that, that really are not affected by it. It needs to be as important to, to, to those people who are not uh, immediately affected by, by it uh, mm -hmm. to also advocate, to, to be those allies, right? This is always how human rights have moved forward is, is to, to have the majority uh, uh, come to, to you know on the side of, of of the thing whatever it might be yeah. no it's 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 very valuable because you also point about the language and how we we, we talk about the value of something and uh, if i may just share a, a personal um, a story of as i was getting into the subject matter also just gen gender equality it was actually a male colleague of mine who gave me the best uh, line to argue why is it important um, that yes it is it is about human rights and the inclusion of women but it's also about bringing in new perspectives and having different kind of conversations so you don't even necessarily need to address gender or diversity but it's about you know the the end goal where we want to go and it's the content the kind of conversations you want to have the kind of policies you want to have at the end so it's something that has stuck with me we're getting to the end of our session but i have one more question that i'd like to ask you and it's actually also wonderful um because it addresses sort of the transatlantic angle that is so important to the german marshall fund um, I think we all agree we are at the moment that, that it's very ripe for us to, um, you know, to tackle diversity, equity and inclusion, um, anti-racism, anti-discrimination and all that. But, um, and this is sort of the question um, from the audience is, you know, could you share how you deal with the skepticism or the hostility um, directed towards DEI efforts in our nowadays also very polarized societies? 
I mean, we're in a very good moment to do this, but it's also very difficult because of um, the dynamics in our society. So um, the, the views of the panelists is that uh, DI and government is not a partisan issue, but rather a common interest for EU members, uh, states or the US administration um, to foster belonging for the sake of democracy. Um, so I wanted to sort of have you share your views, sort of maybe also to round this up, um, you know, how important um, this is, uh, yeah, for sort of where our societies want to go in terms of democracy at large. And um, how do we make sure that people across the Atlantic understand that? Akita, do you want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I start with the numbers, I start with the data, as I mentioned earlier, the data shows something isn't working right. Uh, and I, I talk about fairness, I talk about the fact that they wouldn't want the skeptics to be held back uh, for something that is very superficial. Um, when I'm giving talks, I almost always, I don't, I didn't, with today's, but generally I insist that there be an anonymous option to ask questions so that people who are skeptics will share that information because you can't get after what people are worried about or skeptical of or, or feeling hostile toward if they feel like you know everyone's going to jump on them if, if their name is is attached to it or they're going to be tagged as a racist or a sexist, even though they might be, but anyway. So I make sure that there's an anonymous option so that I, I don't shield myself from the skeptics. And that has been helpful as I have given talks uh, in our organization. People have, you know, said, is it, you know, is it, um, you know, open season on white guys now, you know, or we aren't going to be able to get a job again. Or, you know, I was told I didn't get a job because I wasn't a woman as I wasn't a minority, which allows me to say, whoever told you that was lying and breaking the law if they weren't lying, because you cannot give a job or withhold a job for those reasons legally. And they probably just didn't want to tell you that you didn't get the job. And that's an easy way out that takes them off the hook. So you don't want to work for those people anyway. Anybody who would tell you that, you don't want to work for. Um, and the messaging. So, you know, we're, we're, we talk about how important it is to do this work, to do it well, that we're all smart people, brilliant people, we should be able to do this. And then we talk about that this train is moving, this train is moving, and we want everybody on board so we don't have to row any, over anybody. And we say that with a smile, but we mean it. We're serious about this now. Do your work, do your best, you will be fine. Thank you. Michaela. Thank you. Yes, I'm just uh, being cognizant of the time. So just quickly, um, I, I really think, uh, um, I think it's, it's um, a pedagogical exercise once again. Once we get people to understand uh, why, the why, uh, why this is important, and why uh, and how indeed it is, it is important, it, it should be important for all of us because it's going to be better for all of us. Um, things will move forward and get easier. And, and then you get those people who are not really affected um, on the side of, 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 of the thing and then you know things really open up. And it is indeed an interesting time because uh, at least on the anti-racism um, uh, side, things have taken leaps in the last, uh, uh, say, five to, to eight years, but at the same time, and this is also something that can be seen in history, when things move forward, there's also a certain uh, societal pushback, um, you know, uh, that is trying to push the thing back because change is, is, is difficult, change is hard, and when people who have not historically demanded their, uh, their rights uh, uh, all of a sudden are, are voicing uh, their, uh, their um, uh, need and want for equality, um, uh, this, is, this is kind of one of the signs of change. And, and we're, we're there now in, 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 in these issues related to, to anti-racism, um, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And, um, and it's indeed, as Ambassador said, the train is moving. 
uh, there is no going back. So, so um, this is just uh, 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 how, um, you know, change also takes place. Yeah. Thank you so much for both of you to, to share, share sort of your wisdom experience, your stories. I, I think I, I think they're very, very valuable to allow people to sort of see what can be done in institutions. And I think we really managed to showcase the public sector sort of being at the forefront of this. And um, I also thought that addressing the self-identification is something that is probably going to um, be around for a while because it it it, it allows for creating uh, a new ways of sort of talking about this and for including uh, having more of the sort of sense of belonging and, and, and inclusion in sort of new ways. So I've, I've certainly learned a lot from you and I hope um, you consider the German Marshall Fund as a continuous ally in the endeavors that both of you are um, doing uh, in the US as well as in Europe and I thank you for giving us uh, a precious hour of your day. And I really also uh, thank the audience for joining us and asking questions and um, helping us raise awareness about um, the subject matter. So thank you and uh, goodbye.